Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it It would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. Uh, my guest today is Morris D. Bell, PhD. Uh, he's, he's a professor emeritus and senior research scientist uh, in the Department of Psychiatry at Yale School of Medicine. And we're going to talk about schizophrenia and a specific protocol that uh, Morris is working on uh, called the Automated Test of Embodied Cognition. So, Morris, thank you for coming. My pleasure. Yeah, if you would, tell me about um, your background, and then I want to ask you about your current research. Okay, well, I've been at this for a while. Uh, I'm in my... 49th year of doing uh, clinical research in the area of chronic mental illness and substance abuse. And uh, I'm a senior research career scientist with the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs, as well as a professor at, at uh, Yale Department of Psychiatry. And so I've been engaged in seeing the whole emergence of a recovery movement for people with uh, psychiatric disabilities and impairments. And uh, happy to talk with you about that history or certain features of it. But when I began, uh, it was not uncommon for people to be hospitalized for a couple of years. And of course, there were large institutions all across this country that uh, had uh, their roots in the uh, early 19th century or uh, certainly in the 20th century that were just uh, brimming with chronic psychiatric patients. And uh, that was how people were being treated. And these were uh, often communities of people. And uh, on the one hand, you have the snake pit image of these chronic mental hospitals that were publicly run. And on the other hand, you have a kind of community where people... Uh, raised the food that they ate, and they sewed the clothes that they wore, and they cleaned, and they they took care of each other, and the sense of belonging in this within these institutions. And uh, of course, with the emergence of phenothiazines and the uh, the possibility that medications could control the positive symptoms, those are hallucinations and delusions and uh, bizarre behaviors. Why do they call them positive behaviors when they're not really positive? Well, is there a negative I'm behavior? I'm happy to explain this. This is, so 
when you do a mental status exam, there are things that are supposed to be in the mental status exam, like uh, motivation and interest and the capacity to think clearly about things. And those are called, um, the, the, that's when it, it's, an, it's in a normal mental status. If you have delusions and hallucinations, those are called positive symptoms because they don't belong in the normal mental status, so they're a positive indication of illness. If you have negative symptoms, those are symptoms that should be, those are behaviors that should be in a mental status and are absent, like motivation, like loss of motivation, loss of insight, difficulty, being able to think through things, to pay attention and so So when you hear the word positive symptoms, it's talking about things that are in the mental status exam that shouldn't be there when you hear negative symptoms. It's things that ought to be in the mental status exam and are not there. Right. Uh, okay. That makes sense. Go ahead, please. That's the story. And, um, but uh, I'll tell you the whole, the whole history of symptoms and how they were, were, uh, identified and rated and so forth. I've been involved in all of that. And they they became the foundation for diagnostic criteria. Uh, and that's a tremendously interesting story about how the diagnostic criteria uh, came to be. So, yeah, would you mind telling that story of how it came to be learned, what your modifications or improvements are? So, so who has schizophrenia? And is schizophrenia even a disease? And there's the very dramatic tale of of, uh, of late 19th century psychiatry in Europe, in which you know you had had Bedlam and you had uh, and Charcot's uh, uh, hospital, uh, Hospital Saint Pierre, uh, where um, where people would come and watch crazy people, and um, the it turned out that. Uh, the discovery of syphilis as a cause of mental illness, that that was a brain disease, tertiary syphilis, uh, was, uh, was a profound moment in the history of psychiatry and neurology when suddenly you could differentiate between people who, you know, like the, the old story about the Napoleons, all the Napoleons in the psychiatric unit, most of those people had tertiary syphilis, or general paresis was another term for it. And so when, uh, when that differentiation was made, then the question of, well, what is this other mental illness that people have that is psychotic clearly and has neurocognitive impacts, uh, and it looks like it has a deteriorating course. And so Thus began uh, descriptions of schizophrenia by Kreplin, who saw it called the dementia praecox as a uh, as a uh, early dementia with an inevitable decline, and then uh, Broiler, who who saw it as uh, schizophrenia, gave us that name. And so, what what is uh, schizophrenia to you, to having studied it for so long, okay. versus the classic definition? Okay, so schizophrenia is the emergence of a loss of reality testing around either hallucinations or delusions, particularly paranoid delusions, in which people are hearing voices or seeing things, that leads to dysfunction. And it's very important to include that because uh, today there's a whole movement of voice hearers who hear voices but do not find that they have to interfere in their daily lives. In fact, I, I heard a wonderful story about one woman who, uh, in England, and, and uh, her vicar was jealous. He said, why is it you get to hear voice of God and I don't? <laughs> so, so just the hearing of voices is not enough. Um, it's the loss of reality testing in such a way that it impairs function. And also there are profound neurocognitive Effects. It's like an acquired brain brain injury, and that has been the focus mostly of my work. Uh, what happened was I, I be well, when you when how does it onset? By the way, you said it's an acquired brain injury. 
And I know people, I guess, guys tend to get it in their teens and women, maybe that time or later. So what, what's acquired? Why does it, why does it happen at a certain age or set of ages? What's acquired? That's, that's a very important neuroscience question that we don't have the answer to. There are ideas about, uh, uh the bodily changes of, of, uh, puberty that may have an effect. There's also, uh, so what happens in the brain is that, uh, we now know about neuroplasticity and the development of dendritic spines and how even new neurons can be created. And that's all part of neurodevelopment. And, uh, and then in early adolescence, there is a pruning of this neurocircuitry to make it more efficient. And if something goes wrong in that, then certain brain areas may be more vulnerable to having unusual experiences. So that's one general idea about why the timing. Why do I call it an acquired brain injury? It's not that you've been hit on the head. It's that psychotic experiences become a, uh, a, a pattern of neurocircuitry that then can lead to uh, deteriorations in the cortex. And, uh, these are now uh, pretty well documented on MRI scans and so forth, and that there are changes in terms of uh, EEG patterns, particularly very early pre-awareness processing of sensory information. And uh, that is also, I've had the pleasure of working with people who have done some of that work. Uh, that's, that's a profound indication that uh, whether you want to think that it is a disease, uh, uh, exactly. Clearly, it's having an impact on the brain, which can be identified. But there's no single biomarker for schizophrenia. We can't get, have somebody take a blood test or look at an MRI scan or, or look at their genetics and say, ah, this person has schizophrenia or this person is going to have schizophrenia. The best genetics work suggests um, that there are dozens of candidate genes, that there's something called uh, a company number of variants, uh, the epigenetics, and above all, the interaction with the environment. And so protective factors in the environment may lead to someone who is potentially genetically vulnerable to not developing the disorder. Well, another person who might not have developed the disorder in, has a uh, traumatic childhood and a lot of bad other experiences. Uh, and then that makes them much more. Uh, so uh, that there are lots of stories about how lots of uh, divergent paths uh, to this common pathway of symptoms. And some of the most profound symptoms are really not the positive symptoms. And we've done a pretty good job. Uh, well, I don't want to exaggerate it, but but, but uh, psychiatry has pretty effective tools for reducing the impact of the hallucinations and delusions. They're less frequent, they're less loud, they, uh, the person is better able to reflect on them even if they have them and recognize them as something that doesn't have to command their life. Uh, but okay. the impact on cognition and the impact on motivation and the impact on social relations. Those things are profoundly important in understanding recovery. Listen, how, how can you recover? Has anyone ever talked about recovery? Or what do you, oh, can yes. you recover from? Oh, yes. Yeah. yes, that's the great news. There's a vast recovery movement that's worldwide. Many people uh, have a single episode and uh, don't have another episode. They have lots of protective factors in their environment. They have a good, uh, they have good supports, and uh, they do just fine. And about a a, a third uh, of the people have a intermittent course, so they do well for a while, and then they do they don't do so well. And then another third have a more like a crippling and deteriorating course. And but. But even for people with chronic psychiatric illnesses, there's a whole lot we can do to reframe what's going on uh, in a way that focuses on 
their abilities and not just their disabilities. And the whole development and understanding of what, what it means to have a handicap but not be disabled, that's that kind of language has now come into psychiatry. And so a person is handicapped by the cognitive impairments that come with schizophrenia, but they're not necessarily disabled by it. Because what does that mean? What does that mean? What, what what is disability and what is not so schizophrenia? All right. So so I've started to say my my focus has been on the role of work in recovery. And I developed work programs for the VA and uh, that allowed people with mental illness to have a functional role in a in an accommodating setting in which we could give them feedback about their work performance that allowed them to learn better behaviors and how to cope with things on the job. And they would go on to have increasing amounts of function. Not everybody, but many people. When I looked at what were the predictors of improvement, it wasn't the positive symptoms. It was the cognitive symptoms. The functional difficulties were better explained by the neurocognitive consequences like difficulty with attention and memory and problem solving and set shifting and being more rigid in your thinking. And, thinking. and so then I got involved in developing approaches to those problems. And this was at a time when cognitive remediation using computers was just beginning. And uh, I worked with a colleague, a wonderful colleague, Bruce Wexler, who was on the forefront of this. And uh, later on with Mike Mersenich, who's a, a, a neuroscientist who created something called Brain HQ, which is now uh, available commercially. And we were able to use cognitive training in conjunction with people participating in work activity. And that combination led to significant functional improvements, far less hospitalizations, and honestly, happier people. Then, what, was the, what do you mean, what was the protocol? Uh, have you heard the term supported employment? No. What does that mean? Okay. So um, supported employment is a program of services for people with handicaps to allow them to return to work. And uh, it's been it had been used with for uh, autistic or ASD kids, neurodevelopmentally impaired kids transitioning into into work, and and for people with with uh, other kinds of handicaps, including stroke. And it involves helping the person to get a job in a workplace that can accommodate and provide the kind of supports that help them to get over the initial hump of, 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 of getting used to the job and stay available to them. And a whole program of this was written specifically for people with chronic mental illness called the Individual Placement and Support Program. Uh, I was involved in helping to write the, uh, the SAMHSA uh, toolkit that came out of that for promoting this. And it's now not only in all over this country, but all over the world. I remember talking to a, uh, a wonderful colleague in France uh, who's, who doubted that the unions would ever allow it. She said France is very different than the United States. But in fact, she was able to promote this, and today uh, it is part of what's available uh, in France. It's in Germany. It's in uh, it's in England, and I, I've had the great honor and pleasure of knowing the people who have, have brought these things to those countries. And, uh, the combination with cognitive training is very important because it is the cognitive impairments that make it hard. So I, I had one study in which I showed that attention was the most important uh, cognitive feature uh, for getting through the first three months of work. But then it was uh, working memory. Uh, it, it was memory and learning that helped you get through the next three months. Because uh, for the first three months, you know, you're trying to remember where the bathroom is and who to get along with and things. But then you have to really learn more advanced skills. At any rate, it's been 
just a, a wonderful thing to to have this go from um, in my in, in in my work life from being an experimental model to something which is universal. And there's lots of reason to be hopeful for a young person with schizophrenia today. That is not the same. Uh, doesn't have to carry the same uh, terrible implications that it did uh, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. And honestly, uh, diagnosis today in, in psychiatry is undergoing an enormous rethink. At, at the National Institute of Mental Health, uh, they've changed the, the way they're funding studies. They no longer want to fund studies based on diagnosis, like Here's a study that's focused on depression, or here's a study that's going to focus on schizophrenia. Instead, they see mood disorders as a dimension, psychotic experiences as a dimension, anxiety as a dimension, cognitive impairments as a dimension. And each of these dimensions will have their own uh, genetic uh, inputs and their own uh, contributions from the environment, and um, that studies today are are looking no longer at some fixed diagnosis. What are the, the different flavors then of schizophrenia that you've seen? How would you describe how it manifests differently in different people? Okay, so uh, there's there are all kinds of subtypes with schizophrenia. That was one early effort to do what was called carving nature at the joints. That was the expression for trying to come up with taxonomy of mental illness, carving nature at the joints. There are no joints. It's sausage. There's like it's a continuing dimension. So, so you can talk about schizophrenia, schizoaffective affect and disorder. You can talk about uh, paranoid schizophrenia. Uh, you can talk about a schizotypal personality disorder. Uh, today, we're very fortunate to have a brilliant research group working on what's called uh, attenuated psychosis, prodrome to schizophrenia. Uh, they did a, uh, this work has now been going on quite a while, and, and you're able to identify people at high risk for schizophrenia uh, before they actually get the disease to intervene at that point. There's tremendous evidence that early intervention leads to a milder course. In Norway, they, there's this wonderful national study where they uh, really made an all-out effort in schools, on billboards, everywhere to help people to identify early signs of psychosis and to get these kids into treatment, into an appropriate treatment system. And that has led to much milder course in illness and is a model for other countries. In, in Australia, they have these teen drop-in centers that are essentially early intervention program. That um, you know, you're having mental health problems. Come to this center, you know, and it, it looks like any other teen drop-in center where you can play ping pong and and pool, and uh, there are people to talk to, and they give lots of structure, help people to reduce their substance use, help them to to stay away from the things that are likely to uh, exacerbate the illness. Again, that's a, it's a terrific program. Um, Pat McGrory is the guy that created it. Right, but can you give a few details of the program? What are some of the things that people with schizophrenia can do to mitigate the effects and to, to be okay versus not? Well, one of them has to do with the kind of wraparound supports that can protect the person from having school failure, having uh, early work failure. These things are devastating. I have a teenage girl in my practice who goes to a public school. They have a whole program for people like her, and she has psychotic symptoms and has been diagnosed with schizophrenia and also with autism. And that distinction is an interesting uh, line to draw because uh, there's overlap. And they have allowed her to have the accommodations she needed to graduate. She also has a very good family, an accommodating, understanding family. In that family, 
Uh, I hooked up with the National Alliance for Mental Illness, NAMI. If your listeners don't know about NAMI and they have concerns about someone in their family, I, I can't tell you how important they are. So they, uh, this, these parents, they go to a family-to-family meeting in which they get all kinds of practical advice from other parents who have been there, done that. It's enormously effective. And so as parents, they know what to do when there's a crisis and what not to do when it's not really a crisis. And, they, and the parents get support, makes a huge, huge difference. And of course, you know, there are all the kinds of risk factors in this world. How much, uh, how safe is it to be on the internet? How safe is it to, you know, what kind of drugs are out there and, and all that stuff and all that makes it. So these are vulnerable people, but there are lots of supports. I was on the board of the National Alliance of Mental Illness in the state of Connecticut, where I am. And uh, such dedicated, beautiful people who struggle every day to make it better for others. Very, very fine organization. So those are, those are just some of the examples. Having things like individual and placement, uh, placement and support programs for people who are already fairly advanced in their their treatment. Uh, and another thing that's important is injectable medications. Long-lasting medications are now again one of the one of the issues is uh, people uh, are non-compliant often with their meds. They don't take them in the right way. They don't remember. Part of having cognitive problems is you don't always remember how to take your meds. And um, so uh, long-acting injectables are now available. And I did a study with one in a first episode uh, population uh, uh, with some great colleagues at UCLA. We combined it with cognitive training, individual placement and support, and uh, supported education. What a great combination. And the kids did great. These are first episode kids. They have been diagnosed for the first time with a psychotic illness, and with that combination, sustained injectable meds, cognitive remediation, supported employment or supported education, they did great. So there's lots of reasons to be hopeful that recovery is possible. I don't know. What, again, what are where, is there a workbook that people use, or how has this accomplished these, uh, these efforts? Is it in a therapy situation, in therapy? Is it just as you go between family members, like how does this work? Well, uh, you know, a comprehensive approach is what you want in rehabilitation. Recovery and rehabilitation requires a comprehensive approach with a lot of people that uh, are engaged. So uh, has these family to family programs that are are well developed. Uh, the individual placement and support program has a toolkit that's. Um, from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Administration, that's available. There are psychosocial clubhouses throughout the country. There's uh, in New Haven, we have Fellowship House. In uh, in New York, the Spouting House. In Chicago, it's Thresholds. These are, are uh, places that have been around a long time. They provide social engagement. They provide uh, the individual placement support programs that provide um, cognitive training. They're, um, th- those are hubs for getting the kind of, uh, and housing programs, that's a whole other. The homeless, a lot of them have severe mental illness, and getting housed is a tremendous benefit in their life. At the VA, we've, we have uh, partnered with, um, with HUD, and now have what's called the VA supported housing program. We can get people hunt vouchers and get them into their own apartment and provide the kind of social supports that helps them to stay there and to then link to other rehabilitation approaches. It's this kind of comprehensive set of services that make a huge, huge difference. So these are available. All the state mental health programs uh, have them to some degree. Okay, but what what is new and innovative about the program, the ATEC program that you've developed? Okay, thank you for asking me about ATEC. 
So uh, as I mentioned to you, I've been very interested in the relationship between neurocognition and function. And I've developed a number of instruments over the years related to this aspect of mental illness. Uh, I have a, a measure, several measures related to social functioning and emotion recognition. Uh, the, the emotion recognition task was is called the, the Bell Lysiger Emotion Recognition Test, and it was identified uh, through a Delphi uh, study of all of the measures on emotional recognition determined by NIMH to be the single one that recommended for clinical trials. So I've been very interested in this relationship between neurocognition and, and the functionality. And one of the frustrations is that neuro, standard neurocognitive tests are not fun to do. If you've ever taken an IQ test, you know that, that it can be pretty stressful. And they take a long time to do a comprehensive neuro, neuro uh, psych testing. Um, and I've developed an automated test, which is not just about sitting down and doing questions. You can ask questions like, how are an apple and a banana alike, or count backwards from 100 by sevens, but rather to have cognitively demanding physical tasks that can be measured automatically using motion capture technology and artificial intelligence uh, algorithms to be able to see cognition in action. This is an effort to create a system which is both highly innovative, it's automated, I can go into the details of that, but also it's more like how we function in life. Uh, we've, we don't sit down and think all through time. Most of the time, we're trying to solve problems because we're doing things. And so thinking in action is what ATEC is all about, automated test of embodied cognition. The automated part is that it's administered on screen, sort of like an exercise video. And when the, and, and it, uh, I have a delightful actress who's the host, and she says, welcome to the Activate Games. And uh, there's a kid's version, that's the Activate Games, and then there's an adult version, which is the Activate Movement Challenge, and has jazz music instead of kid music. Uh, many, of the, many of the tasks are the same between the child and the adult. And then when the person knows, understands what the task is, um, you push a button, and Eliza, the on-screen host, she administers the test, and the person is being recorded with a webcam uh, as they do the test. And then the motion-captured data is analyzed and scored. And so the whole thing takes 45 minutes, and you get a measure of attention and uh, response inhibition and, uh, and uh, self-regulation and also balance and rhythm, coordination, and uh, it all comes out as a, as a uh, spider graph with uh, eight different domains of, of uh, function, working memory, delayed memory, all of that. And so it has high fidelity because it's automated. Uh, the administration is the same for every person every time. And the scoring is automated, so you get the same scoring. Moreover, it it's, has tremendous research potential because although we're scoring certain aspects of behavior, there are some parts of the behavior that we're not scoring, but maybe they're important. Since we have it as motion capture data, we can do uh, what's called unsupervised deep machine learning to examine what is a characteristic of this particular disorder that is not found in other disorders that might be a distinctive behavioral digital biome? So uh, that's the, the, the populations are everything from kids with neurodevelopmental disorders, ADHD, to adults with, um, with MS and Parkinson's disease, and stroke and early dementia, TBI. So uh, it's still in development, but I am, I, I think it has a lot of promise. I could yeah. give an example of one of the tasks, if you like. Sure. Uh, so there, there's a, 
uh, a test called uh, the Cross Your Body Task. And this is done to a song. And at first, you're just told, cross your body, touch your ear, 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 and you move your arm across and you touch your ear, the opposite hand to touch the opposite ear. And then the same for, for shoulders, hips, and knees. Cross your body, touch your knees, 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 okay? And then in the second trial, you're asked this time, when I say touch your ears, you touch your knees instead of your ears. And when I say touch your knees, you touch your ears instead. And then the same switching for hips and shoulders. And so there's a round of each of those. And then in the final round, you put all of them together. And you have to do it in rhythm. Cross your body, touch your ears, ears, ears. Cross your body, touch your shoulders, shoulders, shoulders. And you have to switch. This is cognitively quite demanding and uh, is a, a very good measure of executive functioning and relates to other aspects of, uh, of cognition, including self-regulation. So um, that's a brief summary of ATEC. Uh, right now we're looking for commercial uh, partners to develop it and have it be available and so forth. If any of your listeners out there have are in a position to uh, to uh, want to connect with me about that, I'd be happy to talk further. Okay. Well, very good. Um, Morris, what's the best way for people to find out more about your burning calls in general? Where should they go? Sure. If anybody has any questions, morris.bell at yale.edu. Very simple. morris.bell at yale.edu. Write to me and I will be happy to respond about anything you want to know. Uh, what, what about a, a generic place that would be very helpful? I remember you mentioned NAMI. What are some resources for people that have uh, loved ones that are suffering from schizophrenia in general? I, w I would recommend, first of all, that the National Alliance on Mental Illness has great resources and links to just everywhere. They're in every state in the United States, and they, they are a wonderful go-to source. Also, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, has great resources. So those are two. And then your local Department of Mental Health Services uh, here in Connecticut is the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Addiction Services. Uh, substance Substance okay. Abuse Services. Uh, Very good. Well, Morris, Morris, thank you for coming on the uh, podcast. I appreciate it. Well, you, you asked me to talk about things I care a lot about. So thank you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.